Right, I think we should make a start. So um, welcome everybody uh, to today's talk entitled Traveling the Silk Road, a Practical Guide. This talk is part of a series complementing the Aga Khan Foundation's current outdoor photography exhibition in King's Cross in London called The Silk Road, A Living History. I'm Christopher Wilton Steer, the head of communications for the Aga Khan Foundation in the UK, and I'm also a photographer. The aforementioned exhibition is the result of an overland trip I took in 2019 from London to Beijing, crossing 40,000 kilometers and 16 countries. As some of you will know, the Aga Khan Foundation is a charitable organization focused on improving the quality of life for remote and com marginalized communities through a broad spectrum of initiatives, including early childhood development, education, food security, job creation, healthcare, and more. AKF works with thousands of communities across Central and South Asia and the Middle East, hence our interest in this region and the Silk Road. One of the ways we work to improve income opportunities is through sustainable tourism promotion, but more on that later. I'm delighted to be here with Johnny Bealby, the founder of Wild Frontiers, an agency specializing in travel along the Silk Road. Johnny has traveled in this region extensively for 20 plus years. He rode a horse along the Silk Road in 1999, about which he published his third book, Silk Dreams, Troubled Road, Love and War on the Old Silk Road on Horseback through Central Asia. Also with me is Mark Liederman, who heads up product and operations department at Wild Frontiers and is a Silk Road expert, having traveled back and forth along the route for over two decades. And last but not least, I'm thrilled that we're also joined by Caroline Eden, a writer and critic who regularly contributes to The Guardian, the BBC and the Times Literary Supplement, and who has traveled extensively in the Central Asia Asian region for many, many years. Caroline's books include Samarkand, Black Sea, and most recently, Red Sands, a reimagining of tra traditional travel writing using food to explore Central Asia, which was chosen as a 2020 book of the year by the Financial Times and the New Yorker. As the title of our talk suggests, we will aim to provide some advice about traveling the Silk Road for about 50 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, we have about 400 people online so far, so we'll do our best to get through as many of those as possible. As questions arise, please do type them into the Q&A box you can see down here so that we're ready to go as soon as uh, the Q&A commences. Uh, please note that this session is being recorded and will be available on the Aga Khan Foundation YouTube channel in the coming days. Right, let's get going. My first question to you all to set the scene for this greatest, in my opinion, of journeys is why do we travel the Silk Road? Johnny. <laughs> straight straight in with that one. Well, I, I, I mean, I suppose the simplest way to put it is that um, the Silk Road is the most important culturally and the most romantic uh, trade route that the world has ever known. As such, it, it's a region, a journey that is steeped in history that dates back thousands of years as perfect timing there, get, get the map up of the main route of the Silk Road. Um, and that history is very tangible today and can, is evident in the architecture, in the cuisine, in the, um, the transport, in, in the people. And whether you're talking about the kind of Turkic tribes of Central Asia or the, uh, the, the people of the Caucasus or the Persians or the Chinese or all these different, different routes across. You have Buddhism, you have uh, Islam, you have paganism, shamanism, Christianity. Um, so you have all these, this, this kind of melange, this mishmash of cultures that have come together through the thread of the Silk Road. Added to that, of course, you have extraordinary landscapes. Um, as you can see behind me, some of the most dramatic mountains anywhere in the world in terms of the Himalayas, the Hindu Kush, the Karakoram, um, but also some of, the, um, some, some of the great deserts and landscapes. But I suppose what really is the lure for most travelers to, set to, 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 to the Silk Road is the evocative towns and cities that kind of draw you there. And, and you can talk about uh, Xi'an or Kashgar or Bukhara, Samarkand, Kiva, 
Isfahan, Tbilisi, all these names just resonate with, with, with the evocative world of an old travel story. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's for someone like me that, that gets rather excited about that sort of thing. Um, that's what drew me there in the first place. And it delivers, you know, just looking at the photographs you're showing now, I mean, it, it delivers in every way. It, for, for the, for the um, inquisitive traveler, a journey along the Silk Road, um, be it in one go or multiple trips, I, I would say is a must. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna summarize and say it's a, a history of the world, right? Yeah. Um, Caroline. Well, um, I've been working as a bookseller in London for some years and on the side I started to work for a guidebook company which was publishing very good very chunky guides to the Silk Road region and I was doing a bit of editing a bit of PR and marketing and I'd worked on a 900 page guidebook to Tajikistan and by the end of it I thought I have to go there you know I've read so much about it you know <laughs> what is this country it only looks small it's obviously very important um, and I did this great solo journey back in 2009, um, flying into Dushanbe, the capital of Tajikistan, going up into the high Pamirs, coming back down, going overland to Samarkand. And a bit like what Johnny was saying, um, I mean, Tajikistan was absolutely wonderful and it was incredibly adventurous, really, um, looking back. But seeing the Registan in Samarkand was a seminal moment, which kind of set my career in a way. And... Then I became very interested in man-made structures. So I was interested in the opera houses, in the botanical gardens, in the sanatoriums, and the man-made structures and, and, the, and the deserts and the natural landscapes. But it was really that trip back in 2009. And I spent a lot of time in India, but I was like, wow, Central Asia has uh, a real sense of adventure. There's, there's a lot there to be discovered and a lot to say about it. Um, so I just kept going back and I've been back and back ever since. Wonderful, thank you. Mark. My fascination with the Silk Road really started just over 20 years ago in a place in Eastern Turkey called Ani. And it, it's a remarkable place if you haven't been there. It sits high on the Anatolian plateau. And because it sits right on the border with Armenia during the days of the Soviet Union, it was in the 900 meter exclusion zone um, around the whole of the Soviet Union. So it was, completely abandoned. And I remember being there and looking down over the river which forms the border with Armenia. And there's a bridge there which is called the Marco Polo Bridge. And at the time, this was the furthest east on the Asian mainland that I'd ever been. And I knew nothing of what lay beyond other than at the end of 7,000 kilometers, you'd get to Eastern China. And just that real sense of journey was something which really struck with me thinking that there were, you know, trade routes and people that had traveled along that and I wanted to, to join them. So that was, I think, the first thing that brought me in. But it was also as, as I looked around Annie and it, it's an amazing place. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. You've got these incredibly grand remains of these churches and cathedrals. Um, but it's a ghost town. You know, no one's lived there for hundreds of years. But a thousand years ago, um, it was the capital of the Armenian Kingdom. It was a thriving metropolis with over 100,000 people living there. Mm. And it was one of the largest cities in the world of its time. And that thought of, you know, kind of the fortunes, how they rise and fall of various kind of people and civilizations that sit along the path of the Silk Road was, I think, what really brought me into it and wanted me to discover more about what lay beyond, you know, the path of Annie. Wonderful. I think what you you said something there about um, you know pre people who had previously travelled this route, and obviously we have Marco Polo, and there was Avlia Chalabi, the Ottoman traveller in the 16th century, travel parts of it. Obviously Ibn Battuta as well. And I think these characters really drew me in this idea of of being of doing one of the great trips in the world, which for me is kind of the ultimate trip, being a Brit and located in London and Beijing being at the other end of it. It was just too juicy a kind of uh, an idea for me uh, to ignore. You know, one of my first jobs was in Beijing and uh, and when I would fly back and forth, I'd often look out the window and realize how little I knew about pl the places in between. And so this 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 idea started to, ha uh, to, 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 to be this, this seed of an idea was in my mind about how, what would an overland journey look like? But it took many more years to do it. But I think that sense of, for me, it was really like, this is gonna be a trip of a lifetime 
um, to travel over land. I, was, I wanted to travel over land personally just to feel those transitions between different cultures and to kind of feel that familiarity wherever I was with the people around me. So that even by the time that I got to Kyrgyzstan, which is pretty different from the UK, I kind of had that connection with the people that I met that was, I think that comes through traveling over land and that sense of, of continuum. But yes, trip of a lifetime for me, for sure. Right, moving on, onto more specifics here. How to travel the Silk Road as, let's start with as an independent traveler. So um, perhaps Johnny, if you'd like to, to describe a little bit of your experience and, well, and any tips you might have. Well, my, my first journey on the Silk Road, which would have been a kind of rather obscure Southern branch was a friend bet me that I couldn't get home from Delhi overland for the same price that he could flying. So I had 220 pounds in my pocket. I left Delhi, 12 days later, I arrived rather bedraggled in London. Um, having gone the entire journey through the Baluchistan deserts into kind of southeast Iran, up through Iran, out into Turkey and Eastern Europe. Um, and it was an extraordinary journey. And people say, well, surely you should take longer over it. And yes, of course, you know, in an ideal world, perhaps one should. But it was absolutely fascinating seeing it that far, seeing everything move as you're on this major, not just trade route, but migratory route. So the architecture, the domes of the mosque started to change shape, the bread starts to change, the, the, the faces of people change as you go along this and you notice it so much over a kind of 12 day intense period. I only slept horizontally twice on that trip, um, but it kind of got the Silk Road in my mind. And two years later, as you say, I went back um, to Kashgar, bought a horse in the in, in the Yakshambe <laughs> Bazaar and, and rode to the Caspian Sea. So I've kind of had my fair share of independent travel, whether I would recommend either of those, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I would. Um, but, you know, independent travel through uh, along the Silk Road, like many places, is is fairly complicated made less so if you've got lots and lots of time. And I think that's really the key. Uh, obviously there's language issues. There isn't a huge amount of English spoken in a lot of the countries along the Silk Road. Um, so you have that to grapple with. Um, the public transport, although vastly improved um, recently in certain areas is still rather wanting in other areas. So um, it, it's not the simplest part of the world to travel through on your own. But as I've shown, and I'm sure Caroline will, Will 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 um will will tell us uh, where there's a will there's a way so one can do it um and uh, but I wouldn't recommend it on a horse. <laughs> Caroline, I think you can absolutely do it, and I think uh, John is right. It's uh, so since my first journey uh, back in 2009, it's it only ever gets easier. Uh, you know, Uzbekistan has now got very good high speed Spanish built trains. Um, it's a great country for traveling around by train. And I would argue so is Kazakhstan. Uh, the Silk Road went through the southern part of Kazakhstan. And um, the trains are wildly varied in Kazakhstan, but this is a great way to meet people. So I'd recommend, you know, trains in, um, in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, and then in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, you're more reliant on your own negotiations with taxi drivers, which um, does tend to come with its own challenges. Um, some Russian goes a long way. Um, also, um, in city centres now, the Yandex app, the Russian built taxi app is super useful. You can get it in English, you can order a taxi, you know the driver's name, you know the fare you're going to pay. And this is available now in most large cities in Central Asia. This has really changed things and made it much easier uh, just to get back from a restaurant if you're you know, out for the evening. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, with our climate emergency, obviously we're all at the moment horrified by pictures we're seeing in Turkey and Greece and other countries around the world. One of the nice things, and we can't eliminate it completely, is you fly in to a hub in Central Asia, say Almaty or Tashkent, and then you can really spend the rest of your time traveling overland and not relying on flights, um, which I think is a really good thing. Um, and I think um, the walking trails, uh, fantastic trekking in Tajikistan in the mountains, in Kyrgyzstan mm -hmm. in the mountains, you can walk between villages if you have the time and the inclination. So there's many varied ways of getting around, uh, mashtrukas, buses. Mm. But yeah, a little bit of Russian goes a long way, I would definitely say. Good. Yeah, I think it's important, probably we mentioned at this point, what, what do we mean by the Silk Road? Because obviously there's whole different sections of it. Do you do it all at once? Do you do it in chunks? When I did my journey, I went from London to Beijing in one go over four months. Obviously it took many more months planning around that. And I think visas are obviously something we need to 
briefly speak about from my point of view as a British person, you know, you're all right up to uh, through Europe, of course, and into Turkey. It's obviously when you hit the Iranian border, as a British person, you need to have a uh, be with a, a government sanctioned uh, tour group or guide at that point. And that requires you um, several months in advance, I would say three, three months or so uh, to be to to make your visa applications to be vetted to ensure, uh, to, and then you can go and pick up your visa in London. The other thing is Turkmenistan has a similar kind of situation there where you need to several months in advance get that moving um, so that once you get to these points, uh, you can enter those countries relatively easily without having to wait at the border for long periods of time. I also had an issue when I was trying to get my Chinese visa, which was gonna be the end of my journey, they said um, at the visa office, you know, they only want you there if you're traveling within a month. But of course, it's going to take me several months to get to China. So it was that was confusing. Um, they didn't really want me there. They also wanted to make sure I had an outbound flight, but I wasn't flying. So I had to get my visa. Oh, sorry, I had to get a uh, Eurostar because I was leaving from London that way to, to, to eastward um, in the visa office to prove that I was actually leaving the country at some point in the future so that they could make sense of that. So there's a little bit around that that, that needs um, thinking around. Um, in terms of the apps, I mean, you mentioned one, Caroline, which sounds really useful for these cities in Central Asia. I myself, for the first section, which is just to get through Europe, found the website Rome to Rio really useful in terms of a multi-country, multi-stage or vehicle type uh, route. So if you're part driving, part bus, part train, this is a really great way of, of, of showing you your options, including boats and all sorts to get across, uh, well, most of the world, but I found that particularly useful for Europe. And then, and then other apps in China, there's one called Trip, uh, excuse me, <coughs> trip.com which is an app and a website, and it is amazing. You can book all your train journeys and your uh, hotels really easily. It's all in English. I think it works with Apple Pay, so it's super easy. And of course, Google Translate. Johnny mentioned some of the language issues. Um, you know, where I, where I was traveling on my trip, everyone's just talking into their phone in their, in their local, and then that's translating into whatever language uh, is needed. And then the, 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 the hotel person or the taxi person you're speaking to, they can, do, they can speak back and then it comes into English. And they're getting better and better all these time, these apps. But I think those are some, some, some useful tips, hopefully, for, for your own journey. Um, next, let's go to Mark for what about groups? I was going to say, obviously, I have a job, um, and in order to keep me in my job, you can choose to book with a specialist tour operator. Um, and that really kind of gives you, I say, three main options and ways of traveling. One is, yes, in a, in a small group. And most of our groups that we offer at Wild Frontiers, you know, usually maximum group size of 12. Um, and often what we find on, on people traveling along the Silk Road is... Some people love group travel and they'll come back time and time again. Other people have traveled independently elsewhere and for various reasons have just chosen, sometimes through cost, sometimes through concerns about safety, sometimes just through wanting to be with like-minded individuals have chosen to um, you know, travel the Silk Road kind of in a small group. So that's one option. Um, we also do private groups. So especially this is, we're getting a lot more requests since um, you know, COVID happened with people who haven't seen friends or family for quite a long time, um, deciding to actually you know, go and do a trip together. So my multi-generational trips, friends and family, we can do that. Or sometimes, you know, just people um, traveling tailor-made. Um, and we've got a whole range of people that can sit down with you um, and design literally anything from a week to four months, depending on what it is that you want to do. So it can be done in, in different ways if you haven't got the, the time, the patience, the inclination um, to travel solo. Um, and likewise, as Christopher was saying, you can do it in one go, we do have, Johnny actually asked me to design this slightly as a joke a few years ago, and it actually turned into one of our most popular and best-selling trips ever. Uh, it's called the Great Silk Road. It's a 48-day trip that takes you not all the way back to London, but it's um, Xi'an over in Eastern Turkey through the Silk Road all the way to Istanbul. Um, and that has proven incredibly popular. Again, I think, you know, just for that sense of journey to be able to you know, do that in one go, but likewise, it can be done in, in modules um, from you know, one country, as Caroline was saying, to really focus in on a destination and really get to know it, to maybe combining it with one other country or even two, three or four, really depending on what your interests are. So it can all be done. 
um, basically in, in the way that's most convenient for you. Mm. Well, what, one other thing I should just quickly add is that we have quite a lot of people that, that, that have a mishmash. They do parts of it on their own and they drop into some of our trips and then they go back on their own again. I was saying to Caroline earlier, we had a, a couple who went two weeks on a train journey from London to Tashkent, did two of our trips back to back, took a month doing those and then took the train back again, never got on an airplane the entire time. So, you know, there's all sorts of different ways of, of skinning the cat, either with a tour operator, without or doing both. Can I just add as well, I've actually done both. Um, I once jumped on a trip with an American tour company for four days just to get across a certain pass, which was very difficult. And I negotiated with them and I jumped on the organized tour for four days. It was absolutely brilliant. I loved it. I was with... Um, mainly octogenarians from California, but just <laughs> like crazy interest in everything. Really, really, really fun to be with. It's just, it shook things up and I really enjoyed it. And I think a mix can, can work quite well. It is very tiring traveling independently mm -hmm. and to just actually sit back and let someone else take the reins for a while and organize the entrance fees, the train tickets, you know, maybe there's some bureaucracy you need to handle, the language stuff, you know, all of that's taken care of. And a local guide, does know more about things than your guidebook generally. So I do think, yeah, I think a mix can work well. What was the pass, Caroline? It was between Kyrgyzstan and um, Tajikistan. It was very high. Yes, the you know Kizil the Art Pass. The Kizil Art Pass, exactly. Yeah. And it was looking quite tricky for me to do that solo, expensive basically. Yeah. So I asked this company I'm friendly with and they said, pay us a small amount, you can jump on for a couple of days. So I did. Cool. Yes. You know, I, I got left at that border um, um, on the Kyrgyz <laughs> side thinking that it was a, a short walk to the Tajik border. And so I set off on that road into the <laughs> mountains, that broken road. I remember and, it. And, and there's like glaciers in the distance and you're like, where the ham am I? Really when is this, when's this border going to come? And I walked for like two, three, four, five kilometers like this and then just realized you know, I didn't know where I didn't know where I was. Like the road, I could see on the GPS, although I had no connection left. I could see it snaking like this, and I thought that's bad news. Why I just would it be snaking other than if it's going uphill in a big way. So and you were I, walking this, you walked that path, and then Goodness. eventually um, tried to tell a, um, a, uh, a a a farmer I met, could he give me a lift to the border? Dollars, Tajikistan. You know, hand gestures. He said no chance. Cows. Oh. He's looking after, <laughs> right. yes, but you can wait in car until somebody comes. And so I did. And eventually um, these German off-road motorcyclists came by and they said, um, you know, uh, I, I, I sort of, I was not going to let them go. So I stood in the middle of the road <laughs> and said, I need to get to the, to the border. And they said, okay, you can hop on, but we checked my luggage. It was going to be too heavy. So I had to leave the luggage behind. With the or your cam hat. camera equipment. Oh, no, I took that. I yes. took that. It wasn't even that bad. So he drove me up there. And it's like over 4,000 meters. It went to like minus two up there. It was freezing and a long way. And I was just cursing the driver who had took me to the border thinking, he left me there to walk this. You know, it's like 25 kilometers. And, and then on the other side, I had to find somebody who would take me who was driving the other way, who could take me back to get the luggage. And I paid in some dot. Oh, oh, anyway, this, got this, this is why I jumped on the tour, you see. And I, <laughs> I can recall how sharp that drop was. There was bunting and then there was <laughs> mist and then there were ginormous drops. So yeah, very adventurous. I mean, to be, to be honest, a lot, of the, a lot of the border crossings through Central Asia are bizarre, you know, seven, eight, nine kilometers, uh, you know, the one between, um, between uh, Kashgar and, and Saritash, that's about eight kilometers. And I've had to walk that before now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, this leads us on to our next question, I think, quite nicely. When is the best time to go, given um, the, the different seasons, being in the mountains and all the rest of it? Who wants to take that? Oh, Mark. Okay, I'll start. So, okay, if you want to do the lot, you know, like Christopher did, or to do a great Silk Road adventure, you're never going to be able to tick the box for best climate in, in every single country, in every single place, because you're not just dealing with, with, with seasonality, you've also got fun other challenges, you've got various festivals, certain countries like Iran, 
closed down for the better part of three or four weeks for New Year celebrations in March. Then there are borders which suddenly choose to close down either at weekends or again for other festivals. So you're constantly trying to try and get from A to B um, when passes are open um, and also when you know, you're not um, being restricted by other things such as festivals. So I would say Depending on what you want to do, it will vary. Generally, um, you, know, you are talking in Central Asia, especially with continental climate, which means it does get very cold in the winter time and it can get quite hot um, in the middle of summer. You know, places in low lying in Kyrgyzstan or Uzbekistan can easily get up to 40 plus degrees um, in the summertime. But if you want to combine that with some of the higher passes of Kyrgyzstan, that is when you're going to have to go. So over as an overall rule, spring and autumn um, are great, but you may need to adapt that depending on what combinations of countries you want to do. That's nice. I, think. I would absolutely say the autumn. Spring is nice and you get the Nevrus festivals and it's um, a bit fresher. But if you go in September and October, the harvest has happened. So then you're going to eat really well. And the weather in September and October for my taste is kind of perfect. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. Uh, March and April can be quite chilly and you might get some rain in Uzbekistan, for example. I found that surprisingly cold in the spring. So I would say pack jackets and even gloves actually in March for Uzbekistan. But if you go um, in September and October, as far as Central Asia is concerned, you can hit most of the places you'd probably want to visit uh, quite well during those months. That's my favorite time to travel as Central Asia. All I would add to that is that Kyrgyzstan, if you're up in the mountains, you can get all seasons any day in one day at pretty much any time of the year. So um, you, you need, do need to have uh, some warm clothes no matter when you're traveling there. Yeah. For what it's uh, worth, if it's useful to our listeners is uh, I, I set up on my journey in late July, I think, and arrived in early November, uh, just to give a, a, a dates when I took some of these photos you're seeing here. Can we just focus on your hats for a second? Oh yes, yes I forgot to mention audience this. Are want to know what, what you've been doing. So you, is that an Uzbek hat now? And you had a Kyrgyz hat This is hat an Uzbek on? hat, which actually I got in Tajikistan, but um, you see a lot of Uzbek men wearing this um, in Samarkand, for example. This previous one, sorry, I'm gonna keep changing them to add a layer of storytelling to this session, is a Kyrgyz Kalpak hat, um, which you'll see some photos of in a minute in in, in, in real life, in, in situ. And I have a few more coming as well. So I'll keep those as a surprise. Okay, um, this is an important question, but um, you know, it's a difficult one to answer. Is it safe? Uh, I, I kind of, yeah, I, I, I hate this question because I, I kind of feel, you know, you can ask this question about anywhere in the world really. Um, and and it's, it's never a simple answer. Um, as, as far as the kind of general Silk Road route that, that, that you've just put up on that map is concerned, there are no war zones along that route. Um, you know, you're avoiding Afghanistan to the north. You, you, you haven't really got any particular problems. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, I traveled there on horseback. I, I you know, five months there, I traveled there through, 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 through the kind of southern on another trip and I've done multiple trips with Wild Frontiers and I've never really come across any trouble at all. The only, well, <laughs> I say that, uh, I was up in the mountains in Tajikistan with my horse and I had to stay up all night because there was worry that uh, some people were going to steal my horses and turn them into sausages, <laughs> which I really didn't want to happen. Um, but I stayed up all night and it didn't happen. And the only other kind of one or two experiences I can think of are, are with drunk men. Um, which particularly in the mountains of Kyrgyzstan, they, they, they can take this, um, you know, they go up hunting, they go up into the real far reaches of, of the mountains. This really only happens when you're really in the back of beyond. And they take these uh, uh, litre, five litre containers of 90, 96% alcohol, which they generally dilute with water. But once they've had a few, they don't. And they get very, very drunk. And that can get messy. I mean, a drunk man doesn't matter whether you're in London or or or, or Kyrgyzstan it is not necessarily that pleasant. So that's the only issue that I've found as a guy traveling independently um, through Central Asia. Yeah, fair enough. 
I mean, for, for what it's worth, from my point of view, I never had a single problem on my trip. Um, was always uh, treated uh, with wonderful hospitality wherever I went. And honestly, there are parts of, 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 of my city of London, which I feel probably more, uh, uh, more at threat of violence in places here. Not many places, but you, know, you, you get some places more, more here than anywhere I was on my own journey. I don't know if the others want to come in or we can... Uh... I just want to share with you a story just about keeping perspective a little bit. Um, it's a very brief one, but it comes from one of my favorite journalists, a guy called Kevin Rushby. And he tells the story of being in Yemen and he was walking along and he looked behind him and he could swear that he was being followed by this guy in, in a police uniform. And he walked on, he turned left, he turned right and he was definitely being followed. And he went, oh, this is not good. This is not good. Went into a shop um, to take cover and the guy came in immediately behind him and he confronted him and he said, are you following me? And the policeman said, yes, I am. And he said, why are you following me? He said, are you British? He said, I am. He said, good. He said, I received an email from this girl that I met last year and she's invited me to come to England. He said, but she lives in a place called Hounslow, which for those of you that don't know is West London. He said, and I've been looking on the internet. And he said, there seems to be quite a lot of crime in Hounslow. Is it safe? And that whole story really stuck with me about the fact that so often the only news that we often get of places abroad are the bad news stories. And that doesn't mean that the bad things don't happen, but you just need to put them into perspective. And as kind of Johnny and Christopher were saying, vast majority of your experiences will be absolutely instant free. Thank you, Mark. Well said. Um, well, I suppose connected to this question um, uh, uh, very much is what it, well, well, not very much, but partly is what, what is it like to travel as a woman? And, and, and Caroline, I'm going to uh, direct this one at you, um, <laughs> if you don't mind. No, I, and I can see actually someone called Haz and someone called Kathy and someone called Angelina have all just uh, at 1838 asked that question. What's okay, it like good. to travel as a woman? This is tricky because we're talking about a very wide swathe of, um, you know, Central Asia, the Caucasus, Turkey, the Balkans, and everywhere slightly different. I think, you know, common sense rules like it does in most places. For me personally, um, I think clothing is quite important. And I think if you just want to keep it simple, which I tend to do, you wear loose, comfortable clothes, um, comfortable footwear. And you obviously take extra precautions at night, like you would anywhere. So um, a lot of the towns and cities are very badly lit. This can be an issue. More for your sense of anticipation and sort of worry. You know, I don't like walking down a badly lit street. There are potholes. There are often men lurking in leather jackets, smoking, and taxi drivers waiting. And normally, obviously, they're perfectly fine. But if you're feeling a bit anxious, this is, you know, it, it, it impacts. So I think that um, be comfortable, wear loose fitting clothes, wear comfortable shoes. I always carry a scarf. Um, this isn't really safety related, but um, if you go into an Orthodox church or a mosque, it's really useful to have one to just put on. So I always have a scarf with me um, and just be aware. And I think with, with trekking solo, there will be people who will tell me they've done it and it was great and they didn't come across any problems. Um, I live in Scotland. I wouldn't go trekking in the Highlands solo. If you trip and break an ankle, you're in big trouble. And I think if you're a woman, you just have an added. I think women tend to be more aware and a bit more nervous of their surroundings and who, who, who's around and you want to enjoy it. So I think don't trek solo. It is quite risky. I've met women cycling across the High Pamir solo. Massive respect to them. I wouldn't do it personally. Um, what else? I think be aware in taxes. I think Yandex, the app I mentioned earlier, is good because you get a bit of information about the driver. And I think for both of you, that adds some safety. Um, is it safe? I mean, for me, I haven't had particular problems. I did have to get rid of a driver once who made a dodgy comment to me. And the next day I just said, our oh, trip ends here. And there was a bit of a hoo-ha. And that's the only time in many, many, many trips I've had to do that. Be confident if you feel uncomfortable with a guide with a hotel manager, leave the hotel, sack the guide, you know, you're in control. And I think Uzbekistan, to take it as an example, is really one of the safest feeling countries I've ever traveled to. Um, it was a police state really not very long ago. Um, it used to be um, tricky traveling there. You'd get a lot of aggravation at borders. And now they're so encouraging of tourism. 
that you get waved out at the border and like red carpet gets rolled out. It's completely changed. And I think um, it will keep getting easier. But yeah, John is right. Drunken men is definitely something to be aware of for everybody. So yeah, that's, that's my quick wrap up on female travel in Central Asia. Thank you. I guess this is travel advice applicable to most parts of the world as well, wherever you are. Um, I want to move on to hospitality because, um, you know, I think we've all experienced on these trips the most wonderful and warm hospitality I've ever received anywhere. Um, it puts uh, my, uh, you know, the UK to shame, that's for sure. People will invite you for lunch, tea, to their wedding, dinner, everything. When is it uh, when is it okay to accept it, and when might why, when might it not be okay to accept it, Johnny? Um, I, I I I've been in many situations um, throughout this part of the world where, um, I, as you say, I've had so much hospitality; it's been unbelievable. Riding my horse along, I mean, people would take my horse; they would help me feed my horse; they would take me into their into their houses, into their into their apartments, whatever feed me, give me vodka, um, you, you know, you just got an ex the, the solo traveler, the, the, the independent traveler um, on a journey like that, as I'm sure we, we've all experienced, um, will have had incredible hospitality. But there are times when I have realized where the cultural obligation to make a, an offer of, um, of, of a meal, of tea, of, of whatever it might be, is really beyond the ability of this person making this offer to deliver. And if you say, uh, that's great, thanks, yeah, I'll come to your house for tea, you're actually giving this person an enormous problem. They, they, you know, they, I'm talking about parts of the world that are uh, with extreme poverty, parts of Afghanistan, um, parts of Tajikistan, where you just need to very politely hand on the heart say that's so kind but 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 I can't I I have a journey to make I I have to I have to go or a week you know j just make an excuse that you don't have to go to their place for tea because if you do they'll spend two hours trying to get the tea trying to get the biscuits trying to lay on something for you because that's their cultural obligation and and it's, it's sometimes you know you just know it's too much for them so you have to judge it as you travel through central asia you spend more time there or, or on the silk road generally you will pick up what's the right thing to do but just because somebody offers doesn't mean to say you should necessarily accept it thanks johnny mark or caroline anything to add on that I think it's very difficult and um, people are generally incredibly hospitable um, in, in Central Asia and Turkey and the Balkans and the Caucasus um, and as Johnny was saying I think every scenario is different and sometimes at the other extreme of things you think goodness this person's been incredibly kind um, and you think should I give them some money and then you can see that would be the incorrect thing to do as well they'll lose face you'll insult them so you've kind of it's a really delicate balance um, and I think every scenario is different and, and you have to use your common sense and work out, you know, someone is living in basically a mud hut up in the Pamirs and they've scraped together a small meal for you. You absolutely need to leave some money or to do to give something back in that case. But if it's a middle class person in the city centre who's just thrilled to meet you and they sort of send over a drink to your table or something, then you say thanks very much. It's, you know, it's a case of working it out as you go along. Fair enough. Well, I think that leads nicely to our next question, uh, which is how to travel the Silk Road in a sustainable, responsible and respectful way um, and how to give back. And I just want to preface this um, uh, before we uh, hand it over to our panelists um, that, um, you know, circling back to something I said earlier in uh, the um, it, 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 when I introduced it was about um, the Aga Khan Foundation's sort of uh, interest in uh, the region and the Silk Road and it's an area that we work a lot in and um, and as I mentioned one of the areas we work in is economic inclusion and that includes things like job creation and and that is partly we do through um, sustainable tourism promotion and that happens in a variety of ways one is through community-based tourism and that's working with individuals who may set up homestays where you can go and visit uh, and live with somebody uh, for a very small amount of money and they'll, they'll, they'll be a lovely bed, you'll stay in a traditional house, uh, meet some local people and, uh, and, 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 and eat local food. And it can be done very cheaply. 
And, and, and here are three that the foundation supports in, in, in Central Asia and South Asia region. We've got uh, Pamir's Eco-Cultural Tourism Association, Adventure Wakan, and uh, this one, Hospitality Kyrgyzstan. And really it's about particularly creating um, jobs, especially for women, uh, protecting cultural heritage, some of these organizations do, and also protecting natural resources. And then another level, there's through our sister agency, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, there's a whole restoration of historic buildings program. You can see some here um, on the top. And those are not only uh, um, to restore the natural and uh, cultural heritage of those, of, those, of those regions, but also to become magnets for tourism so that um, people come and obviously spend their money uh, in the local businesses. Um, so uh, there's another layer to that where a lot of these restoration projects involve local people to create handicrafts. You can see in the bottom left related to that, which might be sold in a shop. So creating um, uh, livelihood opportunities through the restoration work here, you can see in the bottom center. So that's training people in often long lost re restoration arts so that they can set up businesses or, or, or be involved in future restoration projects. And you can see here in the bottom right, this is a business called Shikam. In the top right, you can see Altit Fort, which was restored by the Trust for Culture in the early 2000s. And as part of that restoration work, they involved a lot of local marginalized women in that restoration work in carpentry, mason work, plumbing, all of these skills were taught through it and then they set up a social enterprise afterwards and sell a lot of these products now to local businesses so culture here and tourism is seen as a tool of development very much from our perspective and then taking it to an even next level you can see on the left Kaplu Palace which has been restored by the Trust for Culture again in the early 2000s completely sort of deteriorated and 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 through our our broader group um the Aga Khan development network there's a, a a hotel group called Serena Hotels and they turn a lot of these into heritage hotels and this on the right is Shigar Fort and I've stayed in this room it is amazing you can stay in that building on the left it's a phenomenal experience this, this will be roughly your view out the window um, and uh, and I can tell you a very good tip here bottom right is room number seven at Shigar Fort <laughs> best one I've looked at all the rooms and it's it, it, it's it's phenomenal so please do try and stay there now I'm going to hand over to Caroline Mark or Johnny to tell us a little bit more about how they might give back as well I've just got to quickly say Kapalu Palace and Shigar two of my favorite hotels in the world um, okay available Wonderful. on Wild Frontier trips uh, Mark I'm going to pass over to you for this one given that you're head of product yeah I I think my first interaction with this was probably about 12 years ago. Johnny sent me off to Afghanistan to um, create a trip in the Wakan Corridor. So for those of you that don't know, um, this is the northeastern part of Afghanistan. Um, and it one time, it's a very narrow corridor. It's only about 20 miles wide. And it actually formed the, the barrier between um, British India and Tsarist Russia. And it's a beautiful, fascinating, but incredibly poor part of the world. And when I went there, I was you know, discussing with the locals how we'd put a trip together. And they told me that actually the year before, um, another arrival tour operator um, had actually brought a trip in there. And on one level, they were very, very good. They didn't take any of the precious you know, food or natural resources you know, that the, the corridor has. They were completely self-sufficient. They brought vehicles and fuel from neighboring Tajikistan. They brought all their food with them. They brought all of their own tents um, and they passed through and left um, really without, you know, damaging the, the local environment. Great to one level. But people also said, we never really got anything out of it. They said it was quite nice to see people coming in and out of the valley. They said, but literally we had no interaction with them and, and we didn't benefit at all. So we discussed how we could do it differently. And this ended up with us deciding to take, and I'll be honest with you, lower quality Afghan vehicles at the time that were only available in the, the kind of the key town of Ishkashim. Um, it also meant that rather than having the um, the assuredness of you know food that maybe you'd brought from the West, we brought some food from Tajikistan, but we tried to pick up some food at the, the local markets along the way. But most importantly, with regards to the accommodation, 
rather than just camping in tents that we brought from the West, um, a few years beforehand, the, the Aga Khan Development Network had built a series of community houses throughout the valley. And they're quite basic. You know, each house had maybe two or three communal rooms with a few mattresses and then one or two kind of fairly basic, but, you know, working toilets and um, washrooms accompanying them. And they built that in order so that the local communities could rent them out to any visitors that came into the area. And so we did. Um, and that $25 per person per night that we spent as we traveled in and out of the valley, um, I hadn't realized what difference it made until at the end of the year, um, someone sent me a, a kind of economic report of you know, economic activity in the Wakan Corridor. And I saw the Wild Frontiers trip mentioned there as having brought in X thousand dollars into the valley and that had been listed. And, you know, in all of my times as operating, you know, and designing trips, I'd never actually seen a single trip actually, um, you know, cited on an economic report as having done that. So especially if you're going into some remote areas, you really can make a difference. Obviously, if you're going to you know, big cities and major you know, urban places, no, you'll, you'll just be one of many and it's great. And you can buy souvenirs and you can interact with it that way. But there are remoter places where, yes, your presence will make a very distinct difference to the people who live there. Thanks, Mark. That's really uh, yeah, interesting to hear that. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Unless anyone wants to come in, we'll move to the next question. OK, food. What's it like uh, to uh, travel if you're a vegetarian or even a vegan? Caroline, oh dear. Yes, uh, I, <laughs> I'm not a huge meat eater. Uh, so I've traveled um, eating very little meat. I can't speak as a vegan, I'm afraid. I think that would be a challenge because I tend to lean quite a lot on dairy products when I'm in Central Asia. So briefly, um, it's a lot easier to be completely honest in the Caucasus and Turkey than it is in Central Asia. Uh, however, if I'm talking about Central Asia specifically and looking at a lot of the questions which are coming in, uh, I think people are really interested in Central Asia and the five uh, republics. So um, in the capital cities, since 2009, they have changed wildly. Uh, in cities like Bishkek and Almaty, you now get ramen restaurants, you get Turkish restaurants, you get Georgian restaurants, you can eat really, really, really well. And within those restaurants, you get a whole range of like lentil soups, really good salads, mushroom filk and kali, you know, cheesy breads, loads of really nice, interesting foods. Um, every town that you visit, even really small towns will have a food bazaar or a section of the bazaar will be dedicated to food. This is an amazing thing to experience as a vegetarian because you can pick up incredible trail mix that you make your own, uh, really good value pistachios, some of the best dried apricots in the world, dried figs, bread, dairy, fresh herbs, really good tomatoes. Um, again, if you go in the autumn after the harvest, you get the best of everything. Um, and there's lots of really good surprises as well, which I want to talk about briefly. You start to learn when you've been traveling in this region a bit more. Um, so um, sea buckthorn, which is not something we tend to eat very much here in the UK, even though we grow it on the coast, goes into tea in Central Asia. This is really refreshing, full of vitamin C, totally delicious. That's something to look out for. It's, it's for sale in like really standard cafes in uh, the bigger towns and cities. Uh, winter melons. The melons in Uzbekistan are the best in the world. Iran and Afghanistan also have incredible melons, but the Uzbeks are melon mad. And the winter melons have fantastic names and you can go to the bazaar and they'll cut slivers off for you to taste and try. The pomegranates are great as well. Um, Uzbek halva, um, sort of like a, a sort of fudgy type sweet, um, filled with pistachios, really beautiful and buttery, great for snacks on the road. Uh, the jams are incredible, mm -hmm. as you'd imagine with such fantastic fruit, sour cherry, uh, quince, uh, mulberry so things that you know you really wouldn't see very much in, in in your home country probably so quite exciting to get those for breakfast um kefir really trendy here now in the west uh totally bog standard has been around for ages throughout the former soviet union you can buy it in fridges and supermarkets very good for you um, i tend to have that at breakfast with like a tomato salad or something then we've got pickles um, it, these are pickling countries, so you can go to the bazaar and you can pick up fantastic pickled cauliflower, pickled onions, 
pickled tomatoes. Um, so if you've got an Airbnb going on in a capital city, you could make your own salads or you could just buy a jar uh, for snacks if you're that way inclined. Um, what else to say? The beer is often less than a dollar a pint. So it, it all gets a bit much resort, resort to having a really nice beer somewhere with some nice um, Uzbek pistachios. So yeah, I'd say it's, it's not always easy. Shashlik is very popular. Lamb and beef is very popular, but often if you're not super fussy, which is kind of how I am, if I'm not feeling like meat, I just remove the meat and give it to my husband or someone I'm with who perhaps wants, or I just, just leave it to the side. That's acceptable in a restaurant. It's not so acceptable in someone's home, obviously. Um, you also get quite good trout um, in some of the rivers, places that are close to rivers. So if you're a pescatarian, you can also get by lots of canned tuna fish as well. So like it's tricky, it's not impossible, and it's certainly not as bad as a lot of people would, would have you, would, would tell you um, from years ago. Thank you. I'm also hearing from David Strip that in September, October, the freshly pressed mulberry juice in Tashkent Market is just wonderful. Yeah. Another tip. Okay, um, anything else, Mark and Johnny? No, other than, other than to say we've taken people, I think the only time we actually had a chat with someone and said this isn't going to work is we had a couple of fruitarians wanting to travel to Mongolia um, and we had to be quite explicit with them that this was going to be probably beyond our reach. But other than that, we've taken people with um, kind of all eating um, kind of you know, preferences. Uh, yeah, you just need to be flexible and have an open mind, but it's doable. Good, good. <laughs> Best figs in the world in the autumn in uh, all across Central Asia, which I which I love. And the and the and the dried apricots in northern Pakistan, yeah. unbeatable. Um, okay, we were. I think we wanted to. I, I think it's also important to think about uh, water, water bottles, all that kind of stuff. Did somebody want to talk about water water filtration? I thought at some point. Yes, I, I will do that. It's one of the things that, um, especially at altitude, you're going to be drinking a lot of water. And it was one of the comments um, that people used to say is the amount of plastic that even a group of 12 people generated um, you know, while traveling on a two week trip was, was quite obscene. So uh, about three or four years ago, um, we partnered with a company called water to go um, And now we are subsidizing people to have uh, water filtration bottles um, and they've been road tested by Johnny I think in Pakistan and various other places where literally they are now so good that you can put it into rivers um, and you can drink it straight you don't have to leave it for hours it, it filters itself right the way through um, and it's just a, a much one, it gives you more independence because you've generally always got access to, to good, safe water, but also you're just not creating that plastic waste that we used to. Uh, well, one thing I would add on this, I, I'm a complete convert to these self-filtration bottles and I've been using them for the last three years, as Mark says, and have very rarely ever bought a bottle of plastic, a plastic bottle of water since. Um, one of the things I love about it is if you are in a slightly smarter hotel in a uh, capital city or whatever, uh, the water can be extortionately expensive. Um, with these bottles, you don't have to worry about it. You just go and fill it up from the tap and you've got your own water. So, yeah, that's another money saving idea. Great tip, thank you. Um, okay, um, what uh, what should I read, or what should we read in preparation for a trip like this? I'll start with you, Caroline. Oh yeah, and you're not allowed to mention your own books <laughs> or even others. You've done a great job of mentioning them for me. Thank you, Christopher. So uh, I would go with a photographic book. Um, I'm not a photographer that's as accomplished as Christopher, but I love photography. And Fuel Publishing, F-U-E-L, <clears throat> produced very good uh, photographic books. And they produced one called Soviet Bus Stops by Christopher Herwig. And one of the great joys of traveling around Central Asia is spotting these amazing, have you got it? I'm spotting, right all right, spotting uh, these incredible roadside bus stops. Um, some are in the shape of hats, some are with wings, you know, they're kind of concrete. I don't want to use the word monstrosities, but they're kind of fabulous things on the on the side of the road and they're disappearing fast. So that's a great book to inspire you to go. Thank you. Mark? For me, it's got to be The New Silk Roads by Peter Frankopan. I'm assuming a lot of people listening to this have read it. If you haven't, you must. You will never view Asia and the Silk Road in the same way. Solid. Johnny? 
Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Mark. That's one of the best books I've read in a long time. But uh, for my choice, I'm going to go back in history a little bit and, and choose Peter Hopkirk's The Great Game, because that was the intriguing story of the kind of battle between Tsarist Russia and Imperial Britain in the 19th century. At the beginning of the 19th century, they were two and a half thousand miles apart, the two empires. By the end of it, as Marx explained in the Wakhan Corridor, they were just 20 miles apart. It's an extraordinary story uh, that takes you into Bukhara and Samarkand and Kiva and all these places. Um, and I read that on my one of my first trips there and it just got totally hooked. A classic indeed. And I'm gonna go with uh, Colin Thubron, Shadow of the Silk Road, which is uh, his journey. I think he starts actually in China and goes across across Central Asia, but it's really evocative and um, a real independent traveler kind of account um, from quite a while ago. So things obviously technology has changed. He didn't have trip.com and he didn't have Google Translate. <laughs> so um, it's a really interesting read to see how he did it. Okay, um, finally, before we go to the q and I just wanted to ask briefly, succinctly, it's not an easy thing to do succinctly, but what has traveling along the Silk Road meant to you? What has it given to your life? Mark. I think it's just made me more humble um, when I hear, and this is not getting political, but when I hear of people talk about, you know, London, where I live, you know, will always be, you know, the, the center of finance and trade and this international city with such confidence. And obviously for property prices, I hope that remains true. Um, but I'm sure that people in Annie a thousand years ago or in Merv or in Kiva or in all these places um, along the Silk Road, um, which are no longer the, the, the hubs of trade and commerce that they once more that they once were. I just wonder whether that confidence um, is um, a little bit um, overconfident and really shouldn't be had. So that's kind of, I think it's just made me more humble um, towards my future. Thank you. Caroline? Gosh, so much really, because my, my career has been shaped by, but I think more than that, and this is going to sound cheesy, but it's absolutely true. I've made so many friends, which I've kept over the years. People that run homestays, young journalists, uh, young activists, young fashion designers, uh, musicians, uh, my husband also works in the region and whenever we visit we just have great catch-ups with people and find out what's happening in politics and it feels a bit like going home sometimes going to Bishkek or Tashkent or Almaty I just I absolutely love it thank you Johnny uh, you slightly stolen my thunder there Caroline because that's sorry and, and indeed we share friends don't we I mean I'm thinking we of do. people like 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 him and Jan in Osh and and what have you I mean these people yeah. are, are just wonderful and have remained friends for 25 years um, but but I suppose for me, again, being rather practical, it, it's a career. I mean, it, it started off as a, my third book and, and uh, travel writing, but I fell in love with the place so much that it's become such an intrinsic part of, of the business that I set up Wild Frontiers. And, and therefore, I kind of remain connected to it through that. But, but first and foremost, it's the friendships I've made that have endured, um, yeah, three decades. Mm. And I think for me, um, I mean, it's been touched on a little bit in previous answers, but is that is that is that connection to the past? You know, I, I think Frank Pan's book's called A New History of the World. I mean, it, the Silk Road is a history of the world. You, by looking down it or through it or traveling along it, you can learn so much about where we've come from and what connects us, mm -hmm. why, why we why things are the way they are. Um, and I think it's a, it is a, it's a it's a lifelong learning really about about our, our history and our past and also with the Belt and Road Initiative where we're going in the future. So exactly. I think that kind of continuum of time, which I find so fascinating, um, and also from a photography perspective, I mean it's just such rich uh, uh, material. And 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 you know I, I I sometimes try to photograph from London and I struggle. I just can't. I just not inspired. But when I travel, especially into these regions. I, know, I feel alive, like in a way that I don't feel um, necessarily all the time. You know, it's just, it's a wonderful experience for me personally to travel to some of these regions. Right, um, uh, we've gone on probably a little bit longer than I had intended. So I, I'm gonna switch over to the Q&A and thank you everybody um, for your questions so far. I'll start with one, I think, um, it, 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 where did I see it? Um, it was somebody saying here, um, Asif Lalani, and I think, Caroline, this may be a good one for you because you were just talking about how wonderful people and places are in Central Asia. But they've said, 
or, or, or asked, why do you think that Central Asia isn't a popular tourist destination? Many reasons. Um, I think it's been ignored. It's been ignored in the media. Um, whatever's happening there, whether it's sort of politics or geopolitics, it very rarely gets a look in in Western press. I'm talking about like UK newspapers and, and websites and stuff. That is changing a bit. Um, obviously, the fall of the Soviet Union happened in 1991. Ever since then, there's been a lot of nation building in the country, sort of starting to slowly open up. Um, and I think that you know they haven't had tourism marketing budgets. They haven't really looked so much to trying to attract tourism. It's been more about sort of oil and gas in certain countries and trying to build up from the massive crash out that was the collapse of the form of, of the Soviet Union, which left a lot of people without jobs and careers and uh, chaos really. So I think it's it's a long build up from that and the changes which are happening since. Uh, I think people are nervous about language. I think people can be extremely dismissive about this region in the West, which irritates me. People dismiss it as the last blank on the map, that it's kind of, you know, this big empty space of, of nothingness. And it's kind of, it's so rich with culture and it's got so much, but unless someone is telling you, which is why I started writing these books, it was almost out of frustration, um, especially from a food perspective. We don't know. And I think, I think it's growing. I think it's, you know, interest is certainly growing, but it's still got a long way to, to go. And tourism really can help in great ways, especially in countries like Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan in the countryside if it's managed carefully with organizations um, like community-based tourism. So I think we're at the beginning and I hope it is managed carefully. Thank you. Um, one about Turkmenistan. What are your experiences of Turkmenistan specifically? Is it likely the most inaccessible country along the Silk Road? Mark or Johnny, do you fancy that? Um, I've traveled in Turkmenistan quite a lot. It, it is different, certainly, to, I mean, it's quite bizarre, really. I, and and I, I'm saying this having not been back for, goodness, 12 or 13 years, um, but it certainly was the most bizarre country in Central Asia. I mean, Ashgabat is, is a bizarre kind of mixture of Las Vegas meets Kashgar meets, um, I don't know, it, it, it's just a weird mishmash of a place. I remember seeing this massive blue glass building which was kind of looked like it was in Dallas but I went up to it and realized that it was just a facade and behind it was a very small crumble down bungalow. Um, years ago there were you know there's a lot of money laundering going on through there and that sort of thing but but it's also a fascinating country and since then I think it's moved on and um, you know Mark can probably tell us more about what it's like to travel there now. We do do a lot of trips through Tajikistan. It's a trickier visa but it's perfectly doable. Um, at the moment, they're not open, as far as I know, Mark, that's right. No, they, they, they actually won the one the first to close down and no indication they're gonna open this year. So effectively this season's dead. Again, it's a very centrally you know, controlled country. So decisions are made very, very quickly. So you know, when it's open, it's fine, but when it's closed, it's absolutely closed, no negotiation. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can I answer um, one? Can I answer one? Oh, yeah, please. Sorry. Uh, wood passing through Iran. So this is from Bent, who is Danish. Uh, wood passing through Iran damaged the possibilities of entering the U USA at a later stage. I'm da Danish, but travel extensively in the USA for business. Not at all, Bent. Um, I have the same issue. I travel to America a lot because we had an office in America and I've been to Iran. All it means is that you have to go to the US embassy and get a 10 year uh, business tourist visa, which was incredibly simple for me in London. It took me oh, best part of 20 minutes once I was down at the embassy. Um, and I now have a 10 year uh, multiple entry um, uh, business tourist visa. So no, no issue at all. They, they had no problem with the fact that I went to Iran. Good, good. Um, sorry, Sarah Fraser, you said we're behind on the hat IDs, details, please. Okay. So, um, uh, this is uh, one I bought in, uh, I think, Kashgar in, uh, uh, it's a, an Oiga hat. We have this one, I think, came from, gosh, I can't remember, maybe China, maybe Xinjiang as well. It could have been northern Pakistan. Uh, this one is definitely a Tajik hat, uh, typically yeah. worn by women. Uh, men wear the green one, women wear the red one. So hopefully that's caught you up. I'm going to go back to my, my do dopey hat here. 
and uh, uh, we shall move to the next question. What about, from Alison Lear, what about traveling with children to some of these areas? Mine both fascinated by the Silk Road and is on our to-do list. They have traveled a lot. Anyone fancy that? Uh, I have a friend who took her very small toddler, about two, I think he was, to Uzbekistan for three weeks and had absolutely no problems. Um, I'm sure the same applies to, to, to most of the region. I think you'd probably be fine. Okay. Guys, any, any perspective on that? No, I completely agree. I, I would say oh. if they're, if they're well-traveled, that's the key thing. It's, it's not the easiest of destinations, but I think if your kids are well-traveled, um, the great thing is, is you'll, um, it's how locals travel with as families, mm -hmm. you know, so you'll be welcomed, I think, in, in, in a, in a really, uh, I don't know, accessible way. So no, I don't see any problems with it at all. And we've taken families to Central Asia, um, again, as private groups, not a problem. Super. Okay. Um, Kathy Klinkhammer, I love rural areas and stay away from big cities where obviously, which obviously have ATMs. Can you say a bit more about how to travel uh, with what money? I'll just quickly jump in there. I'm sure things have changed, but I do remember years ago, the 200 SOM note was the biggest note in Uzbekistan and 200 SOMs was, I think about, oh, I mean, nothing, less than a dollar. And so I had to go and change money at the Money Bazaar and I literally had carrier bags full of cash. I'm, I am going back into the kind of early 2000s here. Um, mm. So Caroline's probably the best one to answer how to do that now because you've probably been there most recently. Hmm. Um, I do a mix generally. If I'm staying, say I'm staying in a three star hotel, which has got like a proper reception desk and everything, I tend to pay by card. Um, if I'm going off into the hills and I'm staying in homestays, the last big town I'm in, I draw out enough money and keep my fingers crossed it's going to be fine. It generally is. Um, so that's how I do it. Uh, ATM machines are much better now than they used to be. I used to get in a real panic because sometimes they wouldn't work and you could be stuck for a day and you just couldn't get cash out and you had to wait for the bank to open. You'd have to go in and get them to do your cash advance. It used to be a bit like that. And the money changes that Johnny mentioned, it's getting ever easier. And really, it's only if you're going into rural areas, you do need to carry cash um which you know you don't need thousands and thousands a, a homestay might cost you between 10 and 20 pounds a night so you know it's it's manageable i think thank you um, i've got a, a few here grouped together saying what are the self-filtration bottles what, what what is the name of the self-filtration bottles could you do you guys what water to go is yeah. the one that we recommend there are a few options um, but water to go is the one that that, that we like. Super. Okay. Can I take the questions on the Wacan because I can see a yeah. few people yeah, have least. asked that. I was going to say. Yeah. So a few people have asked: um, Is it? Um, they've heard that the, the Taliban have infiltrated the the Wacan corridor. So is it safe to go there? You know, is it off the cards? I mean, the thing to say is, you know, we we ran trips in the Wacan for the better part of a decade. And one of the things that was always so fantastic about the Wacan that we used to talk about is even when the Taliban were at their height in the past, they never infiltrated um, the Wacan. It was always a, a safe place. And when you go to the Wacan, you'll see women dressed in this beautiful um bright red clothing it's a very uh, moderate form of islam that you'll find up there um and yeah it was a very liberal open place unfortunately we have heard that yes the taliban as you've probably been um reading in the news and seeing in the news have in the last you know really just few weeks infiltrated parts of the country that they hadn't done before and yes we have had reports that at the moment they are in the wakan so yes if there were a trip today it wouldn't be happening as to next year, and I can see that we've got some people booked to travel next year, I don't know. Um, I think there are bigger questions about Taliban's presence in Afghanistan that I think we're all going to be you know, monitoring very closely in the months to come. Um, but obviously, you know, we will be in touch and we will let you know. But um, it is a concern. Um, but we're in touch with our partners over there. Um, they're fine at the moment. Um, and we'll just have to see how things go. Super. Thank you. 
Um, a question on, uh, uh, where, where did I see it? Craftsmanship. Hello, everybody from Adin Ely. Um, I see some pictures showing craftsmen slash women. Where were the most amazing uh, crafts, crafts people in Central Asia, I think the question is, and do you recommend workshops to visit? Um, I, I can speak from my perspective. Oh. I mean, um, <laughs> Uzbekistan is pretty phenomenal on this level. Um, there is so much to see in terms of craftsmanship. You've got obviously this in the Fagana Valley in the in the in the east. You've got this amazing. I think it's called the Yordalik um, uh, silk factory. This is a region that was one of the first places in the world, if not the first place in the world, to start producing um, silk outside of China. So it has this amazing silk heritage, and you can go to a a museum, uh, not a museum, a whole workshop there, sorry, where you can see literally from worm to end product and everything in between. And that is phenomenal. You can go near Samarkand, there's a wonderful place to visit uh, where you can see uh, paper being made in the original way using mulberry bushes or mulberry tree bark. That's, that's worth seeing. Um, you've got, um, I think I just showed a few pictures before of, um, in, in, again, in Fagana near there, there's um, Margilan, I think is the area, you has this special type of clay there and this long, long history of, of, of beautiful uh, pottery. Um, and then you've got amazing woodwork in places like Kiva. A lot of the mosques and um, there are still supported with these intricately carved wooden pillars. And, you know, um, they don't last forever. So there's still people uh, bashing away, making them. And you still see children learning the craft as well, which is uh, really promising to see that it's, it's still going. But of course, you know, there's places like we haven't spoke about, but if, if you wanted to include Egypt, that's amazing for craft as well, sort of within my Silk Road remit at least. Um, and, and, and then it goes on, you know, Afghanistan and others. But I, I'll, if any others want to come in on that point, um, please do. Well, of course, carpets are the other. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, the whole region is, is, is famous for its carpets. Um, and, and I, I, on my on my 12 day journey from Delhi to uh, to London, I rather foolishly went into a carpet shop in Isfahan and walked out with a carpet. I mean, I needed it like a hole in the head um, and had to carry it all the way back to London. So be warned, if you go into one of those shops, you are likely to come out with a carpet. I would just add to that felt, the felt work oh, yeah. um, in, in Kyrgyzstan is really beautiful. The Sherdex, mm. different kind of design, if you like a slightly more sort of simpler nomadic looking design. Yeah, the felt works lovely. Super. OK, quite an interesting two parter here from uh, Sarah Lloyd uh, Nibs. Uh, two part question, if it's not too cheeky, she says, why do you think the Silk Road is so evocative, attractive to or attractive to travellers? And do you remember any moments when you thought, this is it, I'm really on the Silk Road, and what were they? Good questions. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think, I think a, a, there are a few places in the world where just the name of a town conjures up something that just gets the juices of us romantic travellers going. And, and Samarkand, the golden road to Samarkand, I mean, Samarkand is... Uh, what traveller does not want to travel to Samarkand? I mean, it, it is one of the most evocative oh, places. Ah, indeed. Can't quite see it, Caroline. Can you not? Did it not come on? Oh, that is oh, Caroline's there we go. book, Samarkand. Yeah. Is in my bookshelf back here. Um, yeah, it, 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 you know, so Samarkand, Bukhara, Kiva. I mean, they are so evocative, all of them. It's it, going further into other parts of the world. You've got Timbuktu and places like that, Kashgar, you know. So, and of course, the reason for that is the history of this great trade route. I mean, everything we've talked about, that's why it's so evocative. And it still just drums up this sense of romance in us, I think. Um, as for the second question, uh, I, I, on my horse journey, when I rode out of Kashgar and I crossed the border between China and uh, what was the former Soviet Union, there used to be this great big triumphal arch on the border, on the Torogot Pass at 3,800 metres. Um, and, and it had kind of CCCP uh, as, you, as you entered. And really sadly, they knocked it down and, and, and nothing's there anymore, which is sad, I think. But I rode my horse underneath this arch and, and, and I have no, I, no way of knowing, but seeing as the kind of Sino-Russian um, situation disintegrated uh, in the kind of 1950s and, and nobody had traveled that way, um, 
I, I was probably the first Westerner to, to ride a horse across that pass in, in possibly even 100 years. So that was the moment when I thought, my goodness, I am on the Silk Road. And I rode down the hill there into Tashrabat, which is one of the old caravanserais from the Silk Road. And, and that, that was my kind of moment of, I am a Silk Road traveler. Very cool. And uh, I, I, I think that's the romance of it. It's the, the caravanserai you mentioned, Johnny, this idea, you know, people got help this. I know it's a cliche, but you think of men hooking up their camels for the night and sitting around fires and drinking tea and swapping tails and stuff. And that, and I think the spices, you know, the, the, the evocative things that traveled along the Silk Road, we can't help but get excited about because they're beautiful. Spices, gems, carpets, languages, religions, you know, it's, it's, I think it's that heady mix of everything that a lot of us love. As, as you said, Chris, it is the history of the world, isn't it? I just want to add, for me, a lot of it is the geographical sense of it. I mean, I, my, my background's in classics and studying, you know, Alexander crossing the Oxus River, you know, crossing the Oxus River, which is where it is today which is where it was you know over 2000 years ago um and crossing passes and you know being in places and thinking you know this pass that i'm crossing this is where people would have crossed these mountains you know for hundreds if not thousands of years because it's the only passing point you know for for miles and miles and miles and really kind of you know treading in those exact routes was for me that really felt um, my link with it mm. In the footsteps of yeah yeah definitely that's right i can relate to that i think um at one moment was in the the, the grand bazaar of tabriz which is the largest m m covered marketplace in the world the unesco world heritage site it is enormous it's and 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 uh it has 22 caravanserais in it alone and uh you know employs about eighty thousand people or something crazy like that and you go in and I showed some photos of it earlier. You have, you know, it's arranged like a department store. There's kind of like the gold section and jewelry. There's the carpet section. There's the food section, the spices section, whatever you're looking for, um, electronics, but all in this kind of beautiful, uh, you know, sort of arched passageways and huge vaulted rooms. And I remember reading that, um, you know, Marco Polo had passed through this and I thought, this is, this is pretty good. You know, I'm on the right track here. Um, this is where I need to be for this journey. So that was one. And then I think also in northern Pakistan, when you're in, uh, in, in Gilgit, Baldistan, there, there are, and you're on the Karakoram Highway, which is that main road that connects China and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and southern um, Pakistan, um, so which some call the eighth wonder of the world because it's just... You know how do people build this road in the 70s and 80s that is at such high altitude through this such difficult terrain you know you're in the himalayas the karakoram and the hindu kush mountains where they meet very dramatic and um, and on the other side of the mountain you can see this spindly little road that's that's going like snaking along the edge of the mountain and that was the original you know trading track the original piece of the silk road where you would have battery and camel and people on horses taking their taking their you know, uh, uh, goods for, for, for sale in foreign markets. And that was how people used to travel. You know, we're, we're on this uh, sort of tarmac road on the other side, you know, with a few bumps here and there and a few cliffs, but you know, they were really having to face some, some hardship, but being able to see some original part of the Silk Road, the actual Silk Road was, you know, not that there is one Silk Road, but one branch of it was, was pretty amazing. Okay, we have, um, we have a few minutes left, lots more questions. Um, uh, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people asking for the books, but we can write them in an email tomorrow, can't we? Okay. Good idea. Um, this one is a bit specific, but um, I think any advice about getting a visa for Iran after being refused a visa two years ago? I saw, <laughs> I saw that one. Um, I just thought I don't know how I'm going to answer that. Um, all I would say is I don't know. Do you know why you got um, refused a visa? Because sometimes people do kind of know um, that there is some link with often journalism, sometimes being in the military or some connection. And sometimes it's even just the wording. Um, we had someone whose profession, they were a, a medical writer. Um, but because um, the Iranians interpreted that as a writer and they hadn't, um, applied for a, a journalist's visa, they were refused. 
So I think that is part of it. Have a look back through the wording, you know, what you're using for your profession. Iran, probably out of all these countries, is the trickiest. From experience, we've only had two or three people actually refused visas to Iran over the years. And usually there has been a, yeah, I tried again. And there's usually some understanding as to why that might be. Um, or sometimes not. It is still sometimes a little bit unpredictable. But um, yeah, we, we can look at it again if you want to travel. Um, but um, I just think ask those questions. Thanks, Mark. Um, I just want to mention this one, a big shout out for Mark who helped our horse trip to Kyrgyzstan. My daughter was 10 and could hardly ride. Thank you, World Frontiers. So uh, that, that's a nice one from uh, Christian Wilhelmi. I think I pronounced it terribly, but I'm sorry about that if I did. Um, um, and um, somebody asked about the travel company. It is called Wild Frontiers as well. Um, can you suggest some good documentaries on the Silk Road to watch? Uh, yes, I can, before someone says Joanna Lomley, which is a good place to start, but I, <laughs> I would say we haven't talked about the incredible Savitsky Museum in Nukas uh, in Uzbekistan, uh, which has got an incredible collection of artworks. Somebody made a documentary film about the Savitsky Museum, and if you Google this, um, if you don't know anything about it, it's completely mind-blowing, and it's a really well-made documentary, so that would be my suggestion. Super. I've always thought there hasn't, I mean, not that I'm aware of, a really, really good in-depth documentary of the Silk Road. There was one by a chap called Dr. Sam Wills. Or oh, Wells, yeah, there was that uh, one. Yeah. A couple of years ago, but it was only a three-parter and it, and it, and it, it was... It was good in ways, but it, it was a little light in other ways. Um, so that's that's one. I think was it Dr. Sam Wells or Wills, something like that. Anyway, um, but yeah, there needs to be made a really. You know, you could have a ten-part Netflix. You know, I was going to say I haven't seen it. It's not documentary, but I've seen it on Netflix. The Marco Polo thing. I've no <laughs> idea if it's rubbish or if it's amazing, oh. but um, <laughs> I have really seen that now. I think I tried it, and it's you know. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to just put my stake in the ground here and say that I'm not aware of, of that many or one that does it, and I would like to make one. So, um, you know, if anybody's listening who's yeah. on Netflix or interested in filmmaking, because people often say, "Why didn't you film it?" I'm like, "Well, I was carrying a camera, photographing, and trying to note down stories and travel and do all this." I, you know, you need a team of people, but I'm desperate to do a, a documentary about this. So do get in touch if, uh, if you're keen to do it too. Um, okay, um, somebody's asked, uh, when will travel to Pakistan become easier? Hedy, uh, what can I say? It's always going to be, it's always going to be, it's possible, it's not difficult. I think you're just, it's just bad luck on your part that timing isn't on your side, but we'll try and get you there next year, I promise. Is that heady asking? It's heady. Oh, okay. Yeah, because it's actually yeah, pretty pr pretty simple. Yeah. Justina uh, Pettifer, do you think it's this is possible to do in a small camper van two women? Yeah, I mean, if you look at all the rallies which tend to go through Central Asia um, in ambulances and all kinds of you know makeshift vehicles over the years, they've done it. So I don't see why not. Um. Would I do it? Probably not. But then I think I quite like staying in homestays and hotels. And I think the idea of staying in a camper van, but that's separate. I mean, yes, I think because of all the rallies, it's possible. There's lots of evidence through history of people taking vehicles uh, through Central Asia and the Caucasus and beyond. So I think so. Crossing borders with a horse was quite a challenge in a lot of places. I, I came to the Tajik Uzbek border. The Tajiks didn't know what to do. They said, give me $10 and just go around there past that <laughs> tree and come around the other side. <laughs> so I did that. OK, um, we had an interesting question here about altitude sickness from Anne Baker. Um, uh, does anyone suffer from altitude sickness, hypermeres, Kashgar? Anyone had any problems? I think the only place where this becomes really relevant, I mean, Kyrgyzstan is a very mountainous country. I, I think a third of the country is permanently covered by snow. So it, it, it is high. And a lot of your travels are going to be between two and a half and 3000 meters. But given that most people won't suffer altitude problems below 3000 meters, it's very rare. On all of our trips, I can only think of one or two 
experiences where we've had a problem. Um, and that the one issue that I'm thinking of was in Ladakh, which, uh, of mm -hmm. course, is a kind of southern branch of the Silk Road, uh, where on one particular journey, you have to sleep at 4,100 meters. And, mm -hmm. and that caused one of our clients uh, some discomfort. I mean, nothing too serious, but some discomfort. So, no, generally speaking, you are sleeping below 3,000 meters most of the time in Central Asia. Certainly not. Kashgar is very low. Um, and, and most of uh, kind of Uzbekistan, it, it's only Tajikistan really where you're up above 4,000 meters at times. I, I you right, Caroline? Well, yeah, I think I agree. I'm just trying to think the only time I suffered and it wasn't altitude sickness, I just couldn't do the trek that I set out to do in Tajikistan uh, because I just couldn't, I, I was with a group. It's kind of like one of those groups that goes out to capital every weekend and they were very fit. <laughs> And uh, we all set off and I just couldn't breathe properly. You know, you get that. So I think with trekking, you know, you can't just land and go off and do it. You've got to acc acclimatise, obviously. But anyone who walks knows that. Yeah, walk walking and trekking is much harder at altitude. It's a basic thing, but you have to think about it. Mm. Yeah. Just a, a quick point here on Iran. I know we've touched on it a little bit, but um, uh, Howard from maybe New Zealand or Howard NZ has said visa on arrival if you fly into Iran, visa required prior to if going in by land. Iranians are very friendly. Um, totally couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. It's just there are some some nationalities, US, UK, um, Austra uh, Australian, I think, um, yeah, I think uh, Canadians, yeah. where you have to, uh, Afghans, Pakistan as well, where you have to have this this, this visa in advance. Um, I, I um, you know, if you're traveling on a French visa or an Irish visa, you can just go and arrive in Iran and just walk in and you don't need anybody looking after you or whatever it may be. So if you are from, you know, check obviously on their websites, but um, from most countries in the world, I think you can get a visa on arrival. Right, um, were there any, there's some other tips here about, um, they pulled the third series of Marco Polo because it was very expensive apparently. So that is that. Um, and- Somebody's uh, asking what is travel like in Central Asia during Ramadan? It's an uh -huh. interesting, interesting cool. question. Caroline, have you traveled there during, I mean, I've, I traveled have. A lot, I've traveled a lot in Pakistan during Ramadan. And other than the fact that the Chai Khanas are generally closed, I, 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 I haven't had a hugely different experience. No, but, uh, I'm just thinking I have, and I think the same. I, I remember doing an enormous car journey through Tajikistan and the driver hadn't drunk or, or eaten anything yeah. all day. And then we got to the Chai Khana in the evening and he obviously broke his fast. But no, I, I mean, I was also in Kazakhstan a couple of years ago during Ramadan. It won't affect you very much. Um, as, as a visitor, you can certainly get by. And you'll eat okay in the cafes and restaurants. Yeah. Okay, maybe we have uh, time for just one more question. Um, has anybody seen one, or else I will try to pluck one? Would you have a Hi, good one. Would you have any recommendations for doing the trip on a very small budget? Is it possible, and what would be a reasonable minimum goal to save towards? Thanks, from Hannah Marshall. I, I'll just say one thing on this is that, you know, uh, it pays to be a little entrepreneurial on the trip. Um, I, I was looking at ways to cut costs that I could and and uh, I needed somebody, I had it was on a pretty short uh, time frame to travel across, and in one case, Turkey. And I tried this with pretty much all the tour companies and said, uh, hey, um, how about, um, you know, I give you some photos and you give me a discount. And it worked on that leg. So where you can uh, offer, you know, something like photography or writing or something in return, then uh, that can certainly uh, reduce costs. Guys. Yeah, you've just reminded me of something, which is please don't take a drone to Iran. Oh, yes. <laughs> Very good piece of advice. I, I, I took mine to the border and then and then FedExed it back. So um, Uzbekistan doesn't like drones either. Yeah, yeah. Kurdistan's yeah. okay. You have to be a bit careful in Pakistan. But um, yeah, well, with drones these days, you've got to be careful wherever you take them. But uh, yeah, um, no, I, I, I mean, Caroline is probably best to aunt best place to answer this because you've done the most independent travel there. I mean, I'm slightly out of touch with what things cost and how cheaply one can do it should one want to go it alone, it, it, given that you obviously have the time to do it, because that's one of the big issues. Yeah, the longer life. you've gotten the way, the cheaper it gets, because you get much more experience with knowing what things cost, what they should cost, how you can do things. So briefly, 
Kazakhstan used to be quite expensive. Um, it's certainly come down in cost now. And I think it's, it's a good value destination. I would say in general, like a ballpark figure, 30 to 40 pounds a day is a budget um, budget. So 30 to 40 pounds a day, you'd be sleeping somewhere safe and clean, but basic. You'd be having three meals a day and you'd maybe do like one activity. I think 30 to 40 pounds a day. If you're, say you're in a rural environment, you could probably carve that down to about 20 pounds a day. And then in cities, I'd maybe go up to 50 pounds a day, something like that. Super. Well, um, thank you all very much. I just wanted to close with a few points uh, before thanking our panelists. One is that, as I mentioned when I opened, a lot of the really part of the reason for this talk is that um, it is uh, part of this uh, Silk Road exhibition, which is on in Lewis Cubitt Square in London's King's Cross. So please do come and see that. It's up until the 1st of September. Then part of it is moving, or a condensed version is moving to Toronto, um, to the Aga Khan Museum there, and then possibly some other locations, uh, more on that in, in, in due course. But um, somebody, obviously some people are joining from parts of the world where they, where they can't access this, this. I just showed the URL, which is siltroad-livinghistory.org. And there you can find loads of more content um, uh, really, the exhibition uh, is the tip of the iceberg. The website has loads more um, uh, uh, stories and photo essays and, and more and writing on there as well. We have some talks coming up, one on the great Pamiri house and um, its, its relationship with the Silk Road. We have some workshops. I think that came up in one of the questions, how to get more involved in the workshops. The Found Aga Khan Foundation has a partnership with the Prince's Foundation School of Traditional Arts in London. And um, some of those workshops are online, so anybody can join. Um, and, and some of them are in person at the Aga Khan Center. And here are a couple that are coming up. All you'll be able to find on the Silk Road hyphen Living History website. Um, and that's really it. I just wanted to thank Caroline, Mark, Johnny, very much for being part of this, all of you for joining. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. We'll try to do some follow up in the email that goes out afterwards, of course, with the recording as well. And I hope you enjoyed it. I mean, I had a, a great time recounting some of these stories and I'm sure uh, Johnny, Mark and Caroline did too. So thank you so much. And we look thank forward you. to seeing you at a future event. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Okay, bye.